Welcome everyone. Uh, my name is Sharif Andraus and I'm the Global Natural Resources Leader for BDO. Um, welcome to today's session. Um, it's the second two we have on um, what's new in 2020 financial reports for natural resources companies. For those of us who were with us yesterday, you would have heard Wayne Basford go through um, many of the issues that arise out of the COVID-19 um, for, for mining and natural resources companies in this financial reporting period. Hopefully that didn't scare you too much, or maybe it did. We'll raise quite a few issues. Well, today we're going to have Susan Earl Meadow Hall, who you heard somewhat yesterday, addressing some of those issues in a practical sense as to how that will impact disclosure this year's financial reporting. So let me pass across to Wayne Basford now, who'll be doing the facilitating today. Wayne. Thanks, Sheree. Uh, good morning, everybody. Now, for those people that attended yesterday, we're going to have a sort of role reversal between myself and Susan. So I raised the problems yesterday and hopefully Susan is going to solve some of those problems today. And I'm going to be in charge of the polling and I'm going to be monitoring the questions that are, are deliberately posed to Susan to answer rather than try and answer them myself. So we'll start off with the first poll to get people thinking again about the uh, issues with COVID. So what do you think will be the biggest challenge finalising your June 30th financial report? Going concern, impairment of assets, renegotiating debt. For those people that were optimistic yesterday, you're not anticipating any issues, or do you think there's other issues that will cause you more of it, more difficulty? So I'll give you a few more minutes to uh, think about those, and if people can vote, yesterday's did come up with some quite interesting uh, results, particularly those people that thought they only 4% of people thought that COVID had not impacted their organization. So if we can have a go at voting, we've got 25%, 20, 33% voted. Fifty two percent voted. Sixty two percent voted. Doing well, that looks like it. So I'll give it two more seconds. No, the last flurry of votes. Okay, I'll close the poll now. And if I've managed to work the technology correctly, those are the results of the, the poll. So Susan, what do you think of that? Well, I think it's a bit of a change from what we um, were, we saw initially yesterday, um, it, it, and it does it doesn't surprise me. Impairment of assets, going concern, given you know businesses are shutting down or requiring people to work from home, and the different issues that people are facing. You know, actually, I think this is a very realistic um, polling result. Um, I'm a little bit surprised that not ex anticipating any issues was 20%, but you know that that may be well the case. So interesting results, though. What, what about you, Wayne? What did you think? Um, I'm I'm slightly surprised that perhaps I've been overly optimistic. 39% of people saying they've got going concern or concerns is i think a very honest thing but and i was ex definitely expecting going concern to be an issue but 39 percent is is quite confronting and, and an interesting result of that poll oh, thanks and and just to note we're also running the question session so people if they've got questions as susan's going through please post them and we'll try and answer them as we go through the presentation we will have a question session at the end, but it might be more relevant if people can try and ask questions as, as we're touching on the items. Thanks, Susan. Sure. 
So we'll start moving through the slides. Wayne, I think you've got control, have you? That's a dangerous thing to happen. No, I've not got control. Okay, moving on. With financial reporting considerations, this is what we're going to look at today. Um, looking at the disclosures um, for full year and half year accounts, what ASIC and other regulatory bodies have said about um, filing obligations and you know how to hold an AGM in this environment, AASB 16, our new standards. So this is, um, hopefully everyone's on top of this because I wasn't going to spend too much time on AASB 16 given we've got so much other material to cover, but we are hosting a AASB 16 leasing masterclass for anyone who hasn't thought about AASB 16 because really that is quite a significant change. Hopefully most people on the listening today have already done it for their either their full year accounts at December or their half year accounts. So, you know, this is just really the new disclosures that need to go into the 30 June financial statement. Interpretation 23, uncertain tax positions. This is a measurement interpretation and may mean that you have to increase the amounts that you're recognising for potential tax obligations because this is all about determining or providing for things where it's uncertain as to whether a tax authority will accept the position that you've taken. And a future amendment, so it applies from 1 January 2020, is the changes to AASB3 around the definition of a business. And, you know, these sort of uncertain financial times often means that there's real opportunities for takeovers, um, and acquisitions of assets or businesses at very good prices. And so actually this may well be a standard that people want to early adopt because it's very advantageous, particularly in the natural resources sector. So that's the roadmap of what we're looking at. Yesterday, Wayne was asked a question and it was, Wayne, do we actually have to forecast how we're getting out of COVID when even the government can't make any predictions? And as Wayne most unhelpfully said, well, he said, yes, you do. And the reason for that is because the accounting standards don't really make allowances. So the real response and the answer to that is just, it's disclosure, disclosure, disclosure. If you put the disclosures about how you're, how you're dealing with these, what key estimates and assumptions you've made, then it allows readers to understand the basis on which you've prepared your accounts. I think anyone would accept, and particularly ASIC will accept, that you, know, you, you haven't got a crystal ball, but actually making it obvious as to what you how the basis on which you made your assumptions and what you prepared your accounts makes more sense. So, Looking at what we have to disclose at 30 June 2020, we're going to look at some financial reporting standards that you may not have thought about for a while. And it's because they're not new standards, but they're very applicable in terms of what may need to change in your accounts for 2020. You can't just roll forward last year's accounts and add in the new leasing note and expect that your financial statements are going to be compliant with the standards this year. So we have some new standards to look at. And the first one is AASB 101. And look, I noticed that 39% of people said going concern was an issue. So if going concern is an issue for you, you want to look at AASB 101, paragraphs 25 and 26. And there you disclose the significant uncertainties as to whether the entity will continue as a going concern. Other important um, disclosures to make under WSB 101 are paragraph 122 and 125, which is about the key judgments that you've made involving estimates and significant assumptions you've made about the business and sources of estimation uncertainty at the end of the reporting period that could give rise to a material adjustment. So it's really those material 
assumptions that you've made that if they, if there were changes, it would result in a material difference to your financial statement. So it's not about loading up your financial statement with a heap of irrelevant rubbish. It's really about what are the key risks that the business faces, how have you dealt with them in the accounts, what were the assumptions that you've made. So concepts of estimation uncertainty are nothing new, but this year the process is more challenging. Judgments are central based on the latest available reliable information and those judgments must be disclosed. So SB 108 is about changes in accounting estimates and paragraph 39 says where you've had a change in an estimate from the previous period, then you've got to make disclosure about that estimation that you've made. And so these are, this will be an area where you know, useful lives of assets, um, it's going to be very important and the estimates and the disclosure, the impacts of that. And it particularly, you know, people said impairment of assets, 59% of people thought impairment of assets was going to be an issue. So that I think is quite telling that these are the disclosures. So moving on to impairment of assets, WSB 136 is really the standard that deals with the carrying value of non-current assets. And so this will be your property, plant and equipment, um, the standard that you look at to justify the carrying value. And you know, if you've got an operating mine, you'll have a life of mine model that you then have to adjust into, in most cases, a WSB 136 impairment model. And so the the impairment model has to be run every year if you have unamortized intangible assets such as goodwill or, or unamortized indefinite useful life assets. So the sort of scenarios that you have to consider when you're adopting a fair value less cost to sell disposal model is looking at disclosures about the period over which you've projected cash flows. Now, now normally the standard says that it would assume a life of five years projected cash flow. So if you've used more than five years, you have to justify the reason. Most operating mines have a life over five years, so that's the justification, but you need to put that in there. Disclosure around gross rates and discount rates. And one of the scenarios I was talking with Wayne about yesterday was for a mine. You know, if I have a mine and it's operating in Africa, and do I assume that I can operate it as I would expect to, or do I have to start assuming that there may be shutdowns or problems in getting the available workforce to actually run the mine? And we were talking about, well, do you adjust the discount rate to factor into those uncertainties or do you run multiple scenarios? And the standard actually allows you to do both, but probably what we're seeing in practice is more people doing the multiple scenarios and applying one discount rate to those scenarios, but assigning a probability weighting. And so that's gonna cause quite a fair amount of work in doing your impairment test this year. And Susan, if I come into this, you know, the new world is modelling out different scenarios. So you believe you, you've got an 80% chance or hopefully higher than that, that you won't have a shutdown, but you've got a 10% chance that your, your workforce will get contaminated and can't work or, and you've got a 10% chance that there'll be problems with supply of uh, essential equipment to the mine. Those would have to be modelled out. And then even if you, when you're thinking about how a discounted cash flow works, what are the different scenarios? Will the mine be caught by COVID this year or will it be next year? and how long, if you were unfortunate to get caught by, by COVID, 
how long would the, the mine be offline? And I know I was looking at Sierra Nevada's accounts, and they were, and it's an impres I can't remember exactly the quote, but it's something like 11 of their 28 mines had been made non-operational by COVID. So this probability for the people that have got producing mines and producing wells, there has to be a question mark about what you're going to build into your impairment models. And going back to where 133, 136 goes, is how have you disclosed those judgments? And if you've run an impairment model that assumes you will not be impacted, which is a valid position, you're going to be expected to disclose that. I promised I, I wouldn't be cheerful. <laughs> <laughs> I did wonder how long it would take before you popped in, but that's all good. <laughs> um, looking at impairment of assets, one of the key disclosures, this is really, I think, where ASIC will really be focusing their attention, is the disclosure of key assumptions and the sensitivity analysis that you do around those key assumptions and what financial impact changes, re changes in reasonable estimates could have on your financial statements. I mean, we know that this is always, WSB 136, the disclosure about impairment is always a key focus area of ASIC, even in recent years. Um, and, you know, this is one of the key areas where you want to put the effort in to get the disclosures and the assumptions correct. And I think this is one of the areas too that for people who are members of boards, I would, if I was on an audit committee, I'd want to understand what were the assumptions, what were the scenarios, what were the prices used in the model, because you'd be going to be disclosing that and then you'll be disclosing what percentage movements, reasonable movements in those, those assumptions are. So I think it's a very key disclosure, particularly in the current year. WSB7, financial instrument disclosure. So this one requires disclosure of quantitative and qualitative information about the nature and extent of risks from financial instruments. And the sort of areas that you will want to look at, particularly in the current market, is your credit and liquidity and market risk disclosures. So you've got loans receivable, has the credit risk associated with that receivable? Has, is the counterparty in a position to pay you? I mean, if you're one of these large oil producers that are selling, you know, fuel to airlines, are those future contracts really, and the receivable balance that you've got from them, you know, are they recoverable? It really is something that you would need to consider. Also disclosure of liquidity, probably needs to expand about what, what the significant impact of your, that will have on your continued operations and disclosure of market risk. You know, things like changes in currency, interest rates and commodity price risks are going to be important disclosures to make here. And this is one of the key areas you want to make sure that you've got these disclosures correct about defaults and breaches and other disclosures. So looking at your loan covenants, have you been in breach of your loan covenants? If you've had modifications to your loans, terms and conditions, you know, is there remeasurement of those loans? Because with WSB9, they may cause a renegotiation, may cause a modification, and there may be a gain or loss arising from that. And disclosure of hedged future cash flows no longer expected to occur. This one's a really tough one because we often have, you know, our clients in the natural resources sector who have forward sold and they've been applying the own use exemption. If that production is not going to happen, you've got to then, you know, re redo your accounts and and not have that own use exemption applying anymore. So impairment isn't just about property, plant and equipment and financial instruments. I've talked about the requirements and the standards that relate to those, 
but you know it, it's so much broader and you know you do want to consider is your inventory impaired are investments in associates e and e Wayne talked about it yesterday you know will you have the continued right to tenure or will those impairment um, clauses be, be triggered in AASB6. Looking at lease receivables, and this is if you're a lessee, but also looking at your right of use asset for leases. And I will talk about that a little bit further. And also financial guarantee contracts and loan commitments. These are all things that we need to consider at this year end. And the other area, and I know Wayne talked about it, is about onerous contract provisions. And this particular example, unfortunately, is one that BDO has expect, experienced. Um, now, we've had a lot of conferences that we've expected to attend, and they've all been cancelled. So if an entity is obligated to pay costs for a conference held after the end of the reporting period, but it is cancelled and the conference due to COVID-19 outbreak, the cost of the conference would be recognised as a liability at the time of cancellation because it's an onerous contract. And I had a bit of a look to see, well, what's happened with diggers and dealers this year? And diggers and dealers at the moment is postponed to October. But if it doesn't happen, certain people may find, you know, if that got cancelled, then it could be an onerous contract and you can't carry forward the benefit of any payments that you've made in relation to that because it's now an onerous contract. And then you recognise the obligation and if you've got an insurance recovery, then you need to make sure that they meet the recognition requirements because they may not be virtually certain. So you've got a probability on the provision, but a virtual certainty test on the receivable. And that may cause a mismatch between the cost and losses suffered versus the recovery that you may get from an insurance policy. So I'm going to move on to the general financial statement presentation, measurement and disclosures. And last economic downturn that we had, um, the GFC, we saw Centro um, have problems and one of the one of the real problems that they had in their financial statements was they got the classification between current and non-current liabilities incorrect. And Justice Middleton coined this blind Freddie test. He said even blind Freddie should have known that could have seen that that, that liability that you classified as non-current should have been classified as current. And so there was no there was no out clause for directors to say, well, you know, I'm not really an accountant. You know, that wasn't a technical accounting thing. That was common sense that, you know, if you've breached your covenants, then this thing should be classified as current. So that's one of the areas to really think about is if you have liabilities and you're calling them non-current liabilities, make sure that you have an unconditional right to defer settlement for at least 12 months. So that must be a legal right to defer. Even if you've got an expectation that you may be able to push it out, and it's most probable that you won't have to pay it for 12 months, it still gets classified as current unless there is that unconditional right to defer settlement. And that is one of those things that in this environment, you don't want to get those very basic and fundamental principles of financial statements wrong. The other standard to really think about, and you know, there is incentive to classify loss-making businesses as discontinued, but the aim of AASB5 is to restrict which assets can be classified as held for sale and which operations can be shown as discontinued. And so I just want to recap on some of the rules about this. But in order to be classified as held for sale, it must be available for immediate sale in its present condition. And the sale must be highly probable and expected to complete within 12 months of it being determined to be available for sale. And so that's one of the hard things. And we often find people say, oh, look, I'm talking with the buyer. You know, it's, it's highly probable this is gonna happen. And then the thing falls over 
And then you've really got a problem with the fact that you've classified this as either a discontinued operation or an available for sale asset. So I think you will find auditors being very, very strict about how you've met that highly probable test. Because if you don't want to call something available for sale and then have it not sell within the 12 months, because you're just raising a red flag for saying, well, we got our accounts wrong. Um, the other part of it is, is with, with the discontinued operation, it's a major component or major line of business. So it's wrong to treat the disposal of a single tenement or an exploration area as a discontinued operation. The business of a junior explorer is exploration. So it's only really, we did see the situation of some of our junior explorers become you know, tech companies. So obviously the disposal and the getting out of mining and going into tech was a discontinued operation. So that's that's really the sort of things you need to think about before you can actually classify things as discontinued operations. And non-current assets that are to be abandoned and not sold are not permitted to be classified as held for sale. But conversely, it may be possible that you have more assets classified as held for sale if it requires you to liquidate assets. So we're not saying that there'll be no assets being classified as held for sale, but it's just the tests in WSB5 are pretty strict. And the other standard, which is always very tricky, is fair value measurement. And how do you determine fair value in a market like this? And I'm really glad I'm not a valuation expert, but Fair value is defined in the standard as the price that would be received to sell an asset or paid to transfer a liability in an orderly transaction between market participants at the measurement date. So it's an exit price in an orderly transaction. So it's not a fire sale price. The problem, of course, is, is that you know, the current market is is almost a bit of a distress market. So, so how do we how do we determine this orderly price? And I think in determining this, disclosure is key. So one of the things that when ASIC is looking at reviews and looking at how people have determined fair value particularly when they're looking at quoted prices, they're always looking at the price and the forward prices as at the balance sheet date. So even if, for example, if the oil price is low as at the reporting date and it improves over time, you don't put into your models, your impairment models, the higher restored price. You have to use the prices as at the balance sheet date. And so this, level of disclosure about the markets and the valuation, the inputs that you've used, will be one of the key areas of sensitivity analysis that is required um, under the standard. Wayne, do you have any, que any questions on any of these areas that have come through? I'm not on any of these, but I love the accountants and the auditors or ex-auditors on the line. When we were, when I was commenting on those that survey, there's quite a few people that have correctly noted that didn't add up to 100%. So I'm intrigued with why webinars, surveys don't add up to 100%. And I do suspect it's because people are voting twice. So it is good adage, <laughs> vote early and vote often. I think that is happening on the webinar, but we've not surprisingly had no questions so far on on disclosure and what people need to disclose. Okay, well that's all good. Um, and I guess it's hard, isn't it? If you think we've got going concern and impairment, it's probably a good idea to vote for both of them, but interesting. So other reporting issues, I'm going to move on to that. And we've got the new lease, leasing standard, and we've got 
the right of use asset on our balance sheet. Now we've got to consider that right of use asset and potentially is it impaired as at the end of the year because it forms part of the cash generating unit to which the assets relate. And you don't net off the liability, but what you do do is, you know, you don't, you don't include the rental expense that you previously had in your in your model, your impairment model. But but there is the there is the likelihood that some of those right of use assets that people brought on their balance sheet as at one July 2019 on transition to the standard, then are subsequently needing to be remeasured and impaired um, as at 30 June 2020. The other thing to look at is the likelihood of exercising lessee options may result in least term reassessments. So, you know, if you if you're a contractor and you've leased equipment to a mine, now that mine's all shut down, you may have assumed the life of that lease was going to be a certain period that may need to be reassessed. And similarly, as the lessee, as the miner who's leasing the equipment. I might decide, hey, I don't need these trucks anymore. I'm, I'm sending them back. So that those sort of decisions need to be considered. And we've got impairment of lease receivables for lessors being needing to be considered. Now, there is significant issues around the accounting for lease modification. So concessions that landlords are providing to tenants when operations are interrupted. And luckily on the 10th of April, the International Accounting Standards Board issued a paper and it was IFRS 16 and COVID-19 accounting for COVID-19 related rent concessions. So when you're looking at accounting for this, you need to determine is it a modification to the existing lease contract or was it contemplated in the contract? So it isn't a modification because if you've got force measure clauses, in your contract, it's not a modification. It's just those clauses which on inception of the lease you didn't think were going to be enacted now actually are because of COVID-19. And on our BDO website, we've got papers around this. We've got a special IFRS section devoted to COVID-19 and we do have a special paper dealing with this and the guidance provided by the International Accounting Standards Board. But unfortunately, it really is a dependence on looking at the individual clauses of the leases to see is it contemplated in the lease or is it something that is new and therefore a modification to the lease and requires remeasurement under WSB 16. WSB 19 termination benefits. We recognise a liability termination benefits when the entity can no longer withdraw the offer. So if you've been communicated to the affected employees in sufficient detail that they know that they are going to be made redundant, then you know if, if there's just a general talk of, oh, we expect to have redundancies, that's not sufficiently specific. But once individual employees have been communicated with, that they're going to be made redundant, then the that's when you'll recognise the termination benefits and the liability for those. Yesterday, we had a number of questions come through on the polling, um, on, on the webinar about share-based payments. And WSB2 measures share-based payments based on the grant date valuation. So a lot of share-based payments have been issued um, and they were priced at pre-COVID prices. And they had to be expensed over the vesting period. So if the service hasn't been performed by the employee, that expense gets recognised. Now you have the issue that some of those benefits that employees have been provided is, uh, is no longer relevant you know the pricing is such that it's so far out of the money the employee is not really getting any benefit and people are wanting to modify those and the modification will then if you just forfeit like shut down the old one and issue a new policy that can give rise to immediate vesting 
and it means that the full expense has to go through. So there's no reversal because suddenly this isn't economic. That's not the way SB 2 works. So I think if you're looking at modifying your employer share plans, it makes sense from a commercial perspective, but you may have some rather awful accounting impacts arising from that. So double ASB, we might move on now to interim financial reportings. Do we have any questions, Wayne? No, we've just got confirmation that people did vote twice to distort the statistics, which I think is perfectly reasonable. And some comments that you you obviously didn't miss the exciting live ISB uh, meeting webinar last Friday as to the actual, the, the ISB have moved on from the April paper that we are going to have a new amendment for lessees that have received only COVID related relief and the relief ceases before the 30th of June 2021. So there's going to be some simplification as to whether you're going to have your relief from having to do derecognition of, of your leases. Now it's just going to be treated as a modification. But the, on the leases aspect, people are just to getting to grips with, they, they determined that they would be in a particular site for a particular period. They'd, they'd use a warehouse or they'd use storage. And even though under 34B there was not contractual, it, it made economic sense that you'd use that facility. Everybody now has to review all the judgments they made back in December. I heard of a situation yesterday whereby a company in, in Melbourne has actually just told all their employees to work from home. The lease was coming up for renewal, of which I believe they intended to renew it. Um, they've suddenly decided that they can efficiently work that area, the Victorian operation from home. And I think they've also may have determined that they really enjoy saving the cash flows on the office. So that those type of operational decisions cause you to completely reanalyze all the decisions you made originally on your on your leases and your lease estimates. Just an observation. Back to interim what? financial reporting. So are people going to be let off easily from interim financial reporting? Well, possibly not. <laughs> um, the, the problem that you have, if you're in December year end, and particularly if you're an oil producer, a lot of them are December year end, you have to disclose in your interim report an explanation of events and transactions that are significant to understanding the changes in the financial position and performance since the end of the last reporting period. And so, you know, if you're an oil producer, the oil price at December was US $60 a barrel. Currently, it's about $30 a barrel. So, you know, that is a significant impact and it may change, you know, this, the second bullet point as the disclosure requirement in SSB 134 is made by reference to the last annual financial statement, entities that prepare their first interim financial statements since the annual report, so since the full year account preceding the coronavirus, will need particularly comprehensive disclosures to enable users to understand the effect of the outbreak on its financial reporting. You know, because interim report just goes, you know, we're making reference to the accounting policies, the estimates, the assumptions. If you've got changes, then you need to disclose them. And the sort of things, this list isn't exhaustive, but if you have write downs of inventory, the net realizable value, that's got to be separately disclosed. If you've got impairment losses from financial assets, property plant and equipment, intangibles, contract assets with customers, other assets, that has to be separately disclosed. 
changes in business or economic circumstances that affect the fair value of financial assets and financial liability, required disclosure, loan defaults or breaches of loan agreements. And the, 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 if you had to change how you're determining fair value of financial instruments, like, so the fair value hierarchy between level one, which is the market price to level two, which is an internal price, then you have to disclose the basis of that. So these half year accounts, I don't think you can just say, oh, you know, here's last year's template, let's change the numbers. I think you really will have to sit down and seriously consider what additional disclosures do we have to make to highlight to the market the estimates and the assumptions we've made in relation to meeting our reporting obligations. And of course, if you've had indicators of an impairment, so I think if you're an oil and gas company, the change in the price um, of oil is a key indicator of impairment, then you will need to consider those changes that, that are required to be made and, and do impairment testing. But I think the good news is if you're a half year, you're, you're let off a lot more lightly than those with full year accounts. And the final thing is subsequent events. Another standard that's a very old, old standard, but will have really needs to be considered at, at this point in time. And it's about how do you determine the impact of this coronavirus and any announcements or implementations? You know, if we have a second wave of coronavirus subsequent to year end and operations have to slow down, is that a subsequent event? You know, and hopefully nothing happens around balance sheet date because, you know, that's just going to be really awful to try and work out is it a pre or post reporting event. But there's some of the issues that we really have to think about and consider and really have a good idea of, you know, what the announcements are making. So, regulatory and filing obligations. And look, a lot of public statements have been made by regulatory bodies, and they're really expecting full and frank disclosure about the impact of outbreaks on entities. And I thought Crown Casino's recent announcement was very interesting because they just normalised what their earnings would be and their results announcement. And I think, you know, that's going to be a problem if companies are doing that, because really um, the market's wanting to know what the impact of the virus is, not what the earnings would have been if the virus hadn't happened. So very interesting to see that. They received a lot of bad press doing that too. ASIC is saying their desire that audit quality is not reduced and they're wanting us to use technology. You know, so maybe we can't attend stock takes, but can we attend it virtually? You know, by looking online, by, by um, you know, being physically present. And, you know, us doing this presentation today is just showing the technology is there that we can do things far more easily than previously, you know, by, from, from either at home or in the office. And there are some relief being offered relating to deadlines. So the, the relief being offered by ASIC to Australian reporting entities is AGM extensions have been provided for the December year end but by, by two months, and that will be reviewed depending on you know, whether they're actually legally allowed to, um, by the government to have hold hold AGMs where people attend. And on the 13th of May, for the relief for the junior ends is a one month extension. But ASIC did say that where possible, entities should continue to lodge within the normal statutory deadlines, having regard to the information needs of shareholders, creditors, and other users of financial reports. And the other thing is by extending the deadline, then you're actually you always, when you're doing going concern, it must be 12 months from the date of signing. So the longer you extend the deadline, the longer the period is you've got to assess about this going concern and whether you can continue as a going concern. And given 39% of our respondents today said going concern's an issue, 
that is something to think about in terms of, you know, well, when are you going to lodge your financial report? Wayne, I think now you can run another polling question for me. Sorry. So we've got this poll. So, and on this one, it's definitely much more appropriate that people only vote once, please. So, is this business as normal? Is are we hoping that you can actually know the situation better in October? Therefore, it would be more suitable to delay your your lodgements and your audits, etc. So, be interesting to see what people are planning to do on this. Tempting fate, nobody says they intend lodging in July so far. Only got 53% voted so far. Up to 63%. Still nobody anticipating rushing to the market and lodging in July. Okay, I'll give 10 more seconds. Close the poll, we're doing well. We've had 65% vote and noting there's quite a few people on here that aren't directly account, some auditors on here. So, close the vote now and I'll share the results so interesting at this time even you know as we're having this discussion in May 12% of people are already anticipating using the the late lodgement exemption and it'll be interesting to see of that 69% we didn't get granular of that 69% I would presume the anticipation is to be in the second half of September or even the the last week of September. So it looks as if we're anticipating quite a, a backloaded and late uh, reporting season. Yeah, and that's interesting. I mean, I have booked a trip to Japan for the October and September school holidays. I think though I won't be able to fly anyway, so it's not too much of a misery that <laughs> I'll be checking accounts at that time of year. It is, it's certainly those practicalities that when our AGM is going to be scheduled, your audit committee meetings, your announcements to markets, and now remember you're still going to have to lodge your unaudited 4Es and disclosure, disclosure, disclosure and continuous disclosure needs to be front of mind, particularly of managing directors' risk. So, we're going to look at some new accounting standards in these last 10 minutes that we've got. Um, and I hope everyone has adopted WSC 16 already, you know, for their half-year accounts, um, because it's the new standard for the full-year accounts. But Wayne and I have been talking about this standard for years seems like for years and I think it has been the last three years in particular we've put a lot of focus into it so I'm going to really just go to what is the new disclosure because this is what you have to put in your full year account so you've got changes to your notes to your balance sheet doing maturity analysis for lease liabilities giving do looking at your right of use assets by class of underlying assets disclosure of lease liabilities and additions to the right of use assets and movements in your right of use assets. Profit and loss and other comprehensive income disclosures, well, your depreciation, your interest. But, you know, where you've applied the exemption for short term exempt, the exemption for short term leases, you've got to disclose the expense and also for the low value leases. So you have to disclose that. And where you've had variable lease payments, so they don't fall into that lease liability then you have to separately disclose that you've had those variable lease payments come up on the board. So they're all new disclosures this year. So, and the cash flows, total cash outflows for leases, disclosure of that, and then other disclosures, your nature of 
your leasing activities, the amount of short-term lease commitments, description of low liquidity risk related to lease liabilities of how it's managed, qualitative disclosure of the use of the exemption for short-term and low-value lease items, disclosure of future cash outflows to which you're potentially exposed but are not reflected in the measurement of lease liabilities. So that's an important one. You know, in this time of liquidity crunch, people are going to be looking at all of these sort of disclosures quite closely. So I think particularly this future cash outflows, restriction or covenants, there's a disclosures that you really need to make. And hopefully you've already dealt with your transition to WFB 16 disclosures. So your transitional method and financial impact of that. I will then think about the new interpretation 23, uncertainty over income tax treatment. This is a measurement issue. And what we're looking at, the areas addressed is how you determine taxable profits, tax basis, unused tax losses, and how you consider changes in facts and circumstances. This is important. And you have to do it on the basis that the tax authority has full and complete knowledge of, of your tax situation. So when you apply interpretation 23, if it doesn't apply where it's probable that a tax position will be accepted, it applies when the tax authority, if they knew, they would say, oh no, we think that would be accessible, for example. And so if probable, you use those assumptions in computing the current and deferred tax. If not probable, the uncertainty is a component of measurement. So I'm going to go through an example because that's always the easiest way to understand these things. We have two subsidiaries, B and C, which operate in different tax jurisdictions. B produces raw materials and sells them to C. And B charges C 20% less than it does to other parties. And so there is an issue, is there transfer pricing problem here? And the audit team's consulted with the tax expert who believes it's not probable that that 20% discount would be accepted by a tax authority. There's only a 25% chance. And if they were assessed, it would give rise to a million dollar assessment. But based on the current tax auditing and that, it's only about a 5% chance that this position would even be examined by the tax authority. And after the a five year period, then there's no recourse on the company. So what do we do? And, you know, if the uncertain tax position, $1 million by the 75% uncertainty multiplied by the 5% probability of detection. So it's only a 37,500 liability. And, you know, in these situations, sometimes people say, well, look, 37,500, that's not material. We won't worry about it. The problem is interpretation 23 makes it clear detection risk that 5% can't be factored into the measurement position. So the amount that you should be providing is 750,000. And in many circumstances, 750,000 is material. So that's where this is making us say, well, 750,000 has to be recognized as a tax expense and as a tax liability. Then if over the five year period, you didn't have a tax audit. And so you are now that don't have to pay that 750,000, you reverse it in the period in which it, 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 it closes and, and you, you, there isn't the examination period. So that is quite a significant issue. If you have areas where you're taking, you're pushing the line. Now we've spoken to our tax guys about this and they hate this. They're saying, how on earth do we get? This is all very well in your ivory tower, but how do we get these percentages? And that is the challenge. So, you know, actually a fair bit of work has to be done to determine what are these probabilities. Um, and so that that is the area of this new standard that isn't or interpretation that is in force at 30 June 2020. So if you do have 
tax traditions like this, please do some work on it. And the disclosure is all around the other standards that we've talked about. WSB, the key judgments and estimates and assumptions and conclusions that you've reached within WSB 112. So the final one I wanted to talk to you about was the amendment to a definition of business. And really, this is important because often it's better, particularly in the natural resources sector, to have something classified as an asset acquisition. And the reason for that is with an asset acquisition, you don't have goodwill. And you know, asset acquisition, transaction costs get capitalized to the assets. Asset acquisitions, you have the initial recognition exemption, so no deferred tax, no recognition of non-controlling interest, which you would have if you if it was a business combination. And you know, all these things around contingent consideration and remeasurement of the liabilities accounting for consideration paid in the form of equity. These things are different between an asset acquisition and a business combination. The change that's introduced is the definition of a business has been changed. And really that very final point clarifies that to be considered a business, an acquired set of activities and assets must include as a minimum an input, a substantive out process, at that together significantly contribute to the ability to create outputs. And the other way of looking at it, the standard introduces this new optional concentration test as a shortcut way of concluding that certain types of acquisitions are not business combinations. And that is, is substantially all of the fair value of the gross assets acquired concentrate in a single identifiable asset or group of similar identifiable assets, such as you may have the situation where you've acquired a mine and really the value is all around the capitalised expenditure in relation to that mine, then rather than saying this is a business, we may under the concentration test be able to say that it's an acquisition of an asset, not a business. And that will be really quite advantageous because a lot of people take the view, well, with you know mining companies, there is no goodwill, all the value is in the ground, you know, so goodwill shouldn't arise. And that has always been a problem with WSB3 when we fall into the business test. So if you are acquiring businesses, because there's going to be quite a lot of probably good opportunities for acquisitions, have a look at this amendment to the standard because it may be useful to you. And Wayne, now we hit the question area. Well, one of the technological things I've got to remember to take my my phone off mute. Um, the technical question we've had is for people looking at renegotiating share-based payments, and they're proposing that people go on new salaries, revised terms from July. Is that a way to avoid the complications of WASB2? And my answer is it depends, but very unlikely. You start recognizing share based payments when there's an understanding between the company and the employees that the share based payment is going to be issued. So, depending on the exact facts and circumstance, it doesn't depend on a, on a scheme running from a particular date. Everything depends on when that scheme has come in, been agreed with the employees or the, the KMPs. Uh, so that's the answer on the question. On the questions, I'm looking at my question chat. So if anybody's got any questions to come, I'll give you 10 seconds, else we'll move over to a poll. And I'll move over to the poll now, and I can still watch the questions on another box if people have got anything to come. So we started yesterday with the same question. The whole presentation two hours ago started with, do you anticipate the preparation of your 2020 financial report will be more complicated because of COVID? And it's a question of whether of my 
yourself and Susan have convinced you this is actually quite a challenging reporting season. So if people can vote, and again, I think it would be appropriate if people only voted once, please. Only had 26% of people voted. And this will all depend, Susan, whether you can recall the result from yesterday. I wrote it down, Wayne, so I've got the numbers. Things have changed a bit. Okay, we've got 65% of people voted. People another 10 seconds, and then we'll look at how people are viewing this reporting season. Okay, that's great. We've got to the 70% voted, so I'll close and share. So, Susan, how does it compare? Well, um, probably we've moved a lot of people out of the too early to say, which is which is nice to think that maybe they feel now that they've got some more knowledge. But previously, significantly, it was only 10%. Now we're up to 25%. To a minor extent was 62%, now 66. Um, too early to say was previously 23%, now 8%, and not, not at all was 5%, 2%. So, so we've moved a lot of people out of the too early to say really into significantly, I think. We've achieved, I think, we've moved a lot of people from the unknown unknowns to, to potentially the known unknown. So it may have been a worthwhile two hours. Well, I hope so. Um, I really hope everyone enjoyed attending. And, um, you know, obviously people have got Wayne's and my contact details. So if you need to contact us with any queries, um, we're really very help, you know, we'll help you in any way we can. So thank you for attending. And we will make all of the, the last two days available online and we'll send the survey round that'll give you access to the slides if you if you want copy of the presentations rather than just rely on the webinar so thank you very much